Good morning. Good morning. It is so good to see you. And those that are watching online, we want to welcome you wherever you're at. Just pray that the presence of the Holy Spirit is here as we go through the scriptures together. I do want to just take a moment for several things. And one is to just echo something that was said during the announcements is that we have a worship and prophetic night coming up this Thursday night. And I just want to encourage you, no matter where you're at, whether you're going to watch online or be here, I just feel like this is an incredible time to minister before the Lord. I really feel that's what we are called as a church to do now. Uh, that is one of the main calls of church. It's actually not to just minister to people, but it's to minister to the very heart of God. And this is that season where we are gathering as a church to do that. And so I want to encourage you. I believe that God wants to show off and show up in your life during this time. Can I get a good amen in this house? And so I want to encourage you in that. And also, I just found myself this week being very grateful that I get the opportunity to pastor uh, you. And I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Uh, these last eight months have been very challenging. I mean, I didn't know if you knew we got some stuff going on. And, uh, and walking through this season, uh, I just want to thank you because you've given us grace. You've given us mercy to figure it out. Obviously, we're aware of the governor's order that came out this past week. And we have been praying. We've been consulting lawyers. We've been dealing with leadership and we have been walking through this season. And I just want to ask you, just be praying for us because I want us to be as wise as serpents and innocent as doves. And this is what I want to tell you is that it's no surprise that there is a major tension right now in America between government and the church. And, and, and I think, to be honest with you, there's some things that we need to be very slow to react to and very prayerful in. And this is my request as your pastor. Okay, I always want to honor people, but I want to honor God first. And we do that by not letting a heart of rebellion come in. So while we might disagree and we might do things different, the motivation is never rebellion. The motivation is always honoring God over man. And I want you to hear me. In this moment, it's really easy to do the right thing with the wrong heart. So as your pastor, I'm asking all of us to guard our heart. So that as we journey through this, and though we may disagree, and though we may take some stands in opposition to, I want us to have the right heart in doing it. Can I get a good amen in this house, okay? And so that's very, very, very important. We're starting a new series titled, Come Let Us Adore Him. And this is one of my favorite times of year, obviously because of Christmas, but as a church, we journey through Advent. And I just pray that as we go through this series, that God would really awaken some things in your heart. Because we're going to talk about some things in this series that I think are applicable to all of us, but maybe this year it's a little bit harder to find those things. And that's why I think God wants to minister to us so much. Today, we are lighting the candle of joy. And how many of you just need a little bit of extra joy in your life? I think all of us could use some joy in our life. And so as we go through this, I want to teach you a principle that I've learned and how do we have joy in this season where in some ways it's hard to find it? And, and the passage of scripture that God gave me is Luke chapter 17. The title of today's message is Choose Gratitude. And immediately this passage came to mind. So let's read it. Luke chapter 17, 11 through, verses 11 through 19. It says, as Jesus continued on towards Jerusalem, he reached the border between Galilee and Samaria. As he entered a village there, 10 men with leprosy stood at a distance, crying out, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. He looked at them and said, go show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, look at your neighbor, say, as they went. All right, so as they reacted in obedience, they were cleansed for their leprosy or of their leprosy. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus shouting, praise God. He fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. This man was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, didn't I heal 10 men? Where are the other nine? No one returned to give glory to God except this foreigner. And Jesus said to the man, stand up and go. Your faith has healed you. This is an amazing passage of scripture because Jesus is on the border. He's on the outskirts of Israel. 
And he sees 10 lepers, the outcasts of society, the ones that nobody wanted to interact with, the ones that nobody wanted to have anything to do with. And Jesus is close enough to them so that they see Jesus afar off and they shout to Jesus, Jesus, have mercy on us. And Jesus' response was, go present yourself to the priest. And as they operated in obedience, Jesus healed them. It's an amazing story because only one of them comes back to the feet of Jesus to give him thanks, but all 10 were still healed. And I think we find out something in this story about our culture about what does it really mean to be joyful? What does it really mean to have a heart of gratitude? Now, some of you maybe heard this story before, but if you ever walked out of your house or been driving down the road during the Christmas season and you saw somebody's decorations and the first thought in your mind was, that would look really good at my house. I just don't want to do the work that's required to get them there, okay? Uh, this happened to my wife and I as we were driving down the road. Uh, she saw a sign in somebody's yard, and it was one of those joy signs. You know what I'm talking about, where the J and the O is all spelled out, and Jesus is in the middle, and it's all pretty. And she said, Aaron, I want one of those. And I've learned a lesson in the 16 years of marriage that when my wife says she wants something, I'm going to go get it. And so I made it my life's cry to go find this joy sign. It took me a long time. Evidently, they were popular that year. That was back in 2019 when people were actually joyful. Anyway, uh, and so... I tried to drive everywhere to find one. I finally found one out in Gr Grifton. We drove out there one day trying to get this sign. They happened to be closed. All of a sudden, I found out this was going to be a harder journey than what I thought. I came back later that day, finally got it, put the joy sign in my car. Now, all along, we have this house and this joy sign pictured in our mind of what our house will look like when we get this in the front of the yard. It's going to be beautiful for all the neighbors to see. And they're going to know that the Kennedys are joyful. And so we get this sign. We put it in the, I spend all day basically setting it up right. I get my lights. You know what I'm talking about? The spotlights that you find. I had to find those. And I put my spotlights on it. And I am so excited to bring my wife outside to see this joy sign. She comes outside. And she gets in the, uh, on the street right in front of the house. And she begins to look at it. And she says, Aaron, it's pretty good. Let me tell you something, that's not what you want to hear from your wife. I say, what do you mean it's pretty good? She said, Aaron, the joy sign is beautiful, but the weeds that are being projected on the joy sign are not pretty. See, what you didn't know is, is that we actually sodded our yard ourselves. And I did it in the middle of a torrential rainstorm. So we basically put sod on top of mud. It was a bad decision. It happened many years ago. Do not judge me. <laughs> and throughout the years, we had had this weed problem that every winter the grass would go dormant because when the grass was growing, you couldn't tell the weeds from the grass. So it was okay. <laughs> but then they would go dormant. And then you had these green weeds popping up that were very tall. You know what I'm talking about? And so all of a sudden, I realized that what was actually being projected on our joy sign was a bunch of weeds. And I did what any man would do is I went out there with a golf club and I began to swing at them and try to cut them down. It's a true story. Eventually, I got so frustrated and Lauren got so frustrated that we just put joy in the attic because <laughs> we weren't going to have it. And joy's still in the attic. Here's the point is that many of us want to have joy in our life and we think it's as easy as putting a sign up in the yard. But many of us have weeds growing in our yard so we actually never show forth the true joy of the Lord. And coming to this place that we recognize that this is a season of joy but something's got to change from the inside out, not the outside in. Like, here it is. Like, I, I want you to hear me. God doesn't get anything out of you faking it. And a lot of us in this season, when we're dealing with all the things that we're dealing with in our life, you know, we're, we're the best at like, how are you doing, brother and sister? Well, I'm blessed. But deep inside of us, there's something going on, and it's not joy. It's actually pain. Yeah. And here's the truth, is that a lot of us have experienced pain this season. A lot of us have experienced fear. A lot of us have experienced things that are the absolute opposite of joy. And if we're not careful, we're going to put on our joyful smile. 
but it's ever, never going to actually touch our hearts, and that is not God's plan for your life. A few thoughts about the scripture that we just read that I love. God's grace and mercy isn't based on my response, but rather his goodness. God's mercy and grace isn't based on my response, it's based on his goodness. I love the thought that all 10 were healed. Have you thought about that? And only one of them came back. So what that means is in my relationship with God, just his blessing isn't the indication of my heart. This is where we get a works-based mentality and we start working God. It's like, if we do everything right, then this is how it's going to go in my life. But how many of you have lived life long enough to know that's not actually how it happens? That sometimes things happen in our life, even though we feel like, you know, we're in good relationship with God, sometimes bad things just happen. And it messes with our theology. It messes with our relationship with God. And it was never intended to because here we find that God's goodness and mercy isn't based on my goodness. It's based on his goodness. It's powerful. One came back and was grateful. Only one allowed their gratitude to turn to worship and thanksgiving. Ten or nine went on their way. And we can make all types of assumptions about that. But the reality is, is that one allowed their gratitude to change their posture towards worship and thanksgiving. The last thought process about that passage of scripture is that it was the Gentile, the outsider, that came back and worshiped Jesus at his feet. It wasn't the Jewish people. And one of the things that we can maybe dig into, and many theologians would agree, is that the nine thought they were owed something. The Gentile actually viewed what happened as a gift. So coming to this place that we say, hold on a second, we need something to shift in our hearts, not just on the outside. We don't need a bunch of joy signs. We need a joyful heart. So let's talk about a heart of gratitude today. First point that I have for you is a grateful heart is a choice. A grateful heart is a choice. Now, I need you to hang with me in this point. Because I think it's very, very important to listen to what I have to say. We're going to read some scripture, but I need to coach you through this. Because some of us, when we come to this, we we miss something in church so many times, and it's not God's highest and best for us. But listen, we have to choose gratitude. We have to choose gratitude. Choosing gratitude is a habit. It's a decision that cuts against the grain. I want you to think about how it must have felt for 10 to be going one direction and one of those 10 decided to turn and go the other way. I believe that is such a picture of culture today that if you're going to choose to have a grateful heart, you are absolutely going to be fighting against culture. You are absolutely going to have to understand that if I'm going to choose to live this way, it is not going to go with the flow that I'm going to have to make a habit out of this because everything in this culture is fighting me from being grateful. It's actually trying to teach me to be entitled. Philippians 4, 4 through 7 says, Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Listen to this. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything. What in the world is he talking about? Instead, pray about everything. So here, the key to not worry is actually prayer. So listen to me. It is awesome to read this Bible, okay? Statistically, we know that Christians don't. But I'm telling you, in this house, you need to put your nose in this Bible, especially in this season, and you need to get everything out of it you can. But one of the great things that God has taught his people how to do is to pray. Because prayer is the transference of burden. It is literally that I have a father that I can go to at any given moment and I can give my worry to him. Nothing is too small for our God. We're able to take anything that we worry about and give it to him. And he says, I will take your worry and now I will give you peace. It is the great exchange. It is the great promise. We are not on our own. We don't have to figure it out on our own. We have a father who welcomes his children to come to him. Come on, somebody in this house. Getting to that place that we realize this is the ability to transfer, transfer what we're feeling 
It says, tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you'll experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. I want to teach you something. Listen to me. Joy and the secret of joy is not trying to find something in front of you. It's actually looking back behind you and seeing what he's done already in your life. Did you hear me? One of the secrets to joy is not looking just for what he will do. It's actually sometimes taking a moment and turning around and seeing what he's already done. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18 says, Always be joyful. Never stop praying. You see the connection between joy and prayer? Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ. A few years ago, Lauren and I went to see a marriage counselor. We go several times a year. Marriage is one of those places in our life that I think we should always be getting better. Uh, our life and our fulfillment in life was meant to come from that relationship. But we went to this marriage counselor and they taught us something. And I've taught it to you before. But one of the ways in which, like all couples, we were struggling with is how do we communicate? Um, I'm a fixer. Any guys in the house that just like to fix your girl's problems? I like to fix everything. I'm going to say, if you got a problem, I'll fix it. I don't know if it's a good fix, but I'm going to try. And then Lauren was like, I don't want you to fix my problems. I just want you to listen to my problems. I was like, that's excruciating to me. I want to fix your problems. I'm a professional fixer. <laughs> that sounds horrible. Anyway, um, and so we went and they taught us how to communicate. And one of the things is they taught us every day to go through the four W's. If you're married in this place, if you're not married, I think this is an incredible way to have a quiet time with Jesus. And we talked about our wows, our worries, our wishes, and our wounds. Every single day. We talked about what's our wows, what's our worries, what's our wishes, and what's our wounds. Every day, all right? And one of the things that I discovered about that is the first time we did it, it wasn't hard to figure out a wow because we hadn't talked about it in a while. You know, so I went to the big thing that had happened in my life over the last three months. But I want you to think about it. every single day, doing it every single day, all of a sudden, you got to start looking for a while. Yeah. All of a sudden, you got to start figuring out, hold on a second, what's, what's a while? And the wow became an interaction I had with Wesley or David the day before. The wow became the way Lauren looked at me walking in the door one day. The wow became something that God spoke to my heart. The wow became not such a big, seemingly deal. This is what I discovered in the process. Is it didn't take much to make me worry, but it took a lot to make me go wow. And here we see where the culture is infiltrating the way we live. We know that when it doesn't take much to cause you to worry, but it takes a lot to make you go wow. Developing the habit of saying, I'm going to find the wow. I'm going to see through the eyes of wonder. I'm going to see life the way God intended for me to see it, that he is a good father who takes great care of his children, that I'm not out here on my own, but God every single day is providing for me. He is taking care of me. Yes, we go through hard times. Yes, we go through moments of stress, but we can rest assured that our father is present. And if we'll search hard enough, we can find the wow. We have to fight sometimes to find the wows of life. But joy is available to those that choose to find it. I must admit to you that everything in our culture is fighting against you in this. Everything. Uh, we live in a comparison culture. So everything we see on social media is comparing our life to somebody's highlight reel. Everything we listen to in the news is negative, and it doesn't matter if you're listening to CNN or if you're listening to Fox News. Everything that we listen to in our culture is trying to make us ungrateful and trying to keep us from seeing the joy that is around us. This has been one of the hardest seasons in my life, and many of you know that I'm celebrating Thanksgiving and Christmas for the first time without my father. 
But I want you to hear me. I can find joy in this season. I can see it and I can find it. And yes, there is pain. Yes, there is tears. But I have hope for you today and it is not in my words. It is in the words of Jesus. That joy and the joy of the Lord is our strength. If we will look for joy, we can find joy. But it will take us looking for it. Come on, somebody. We've got to be ones that say, hang on a second, we're going to lean in. We're going to lean in and we're going to find the joy. Number two, a grateful heart kills an entitled spirit. An ungrateful heart or a grateful heart kills an entitled spirit. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Luke chapter 7. I'm going to show you one verse of scripture there, but I'm going to tell you the context of that chapter. And it is this story, and, and, and you've heard this story before, but it's when the sinful lady comes and she anoints Jesus' feet. And, you know, there's a lot of thought processes about who that woman is. We're not for sure, but we know that she was a sinful lady. And she walks into the house of a Pharisee. And she begins to stand over Jesus at his feet and begins to cry on his feet and begins to wash his feet and dry his feet with her hair. It's a beautiful story of unashamed, uninhibited worship in the midst of a room that was absolutely hostile to her presence. So she is in a place that she is not welcome, that it is not, I mean, this is, she knows what she's walking into. It's basically like walking into the most judgmental church, judgmental people you've ever been around in your life, everybody knowing what you are and still just worshiping God anyway. And everybody's saying, well, she's crazy. (laughs) So he goes into this place or she goes into this place. And there's a Pharisee there that begins to judge her and he judges her in his mind and Jesus reads his thoughts and then he engages him in conversation. And he basically begins to talk about forgiveness. And I want to show you this passage in Luke chapter 7, verse 47. And this is Jesus saying, I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. Now, if you're not careful what you're going to read there, and he's speaking to the Pharisee, you're going to read that Jesus is basically saying, well, if you were a great sinner and you were crazy growing up, then obviously you've been forgiven us so much and so you're going to love me more than the person who grew up in church and Sunday school all their life and did nothing wrong. Basically, it's the difference between me and my sister. <laughs> That's funny. I don't care what you say. Um, but that's not what he's saying. You see, all of our sin costs Jesus the same. Uh, As pastors, we struggle with this because at one point, we don't want to downgrade sin. On the other side, I also don't want you to get so enamored with sin that you forget God's grace. So we understand that sin has different consequences, not before God, but before in relation to each other. So recognizing that sin does carry different consequences, but to God, all sin costs God the same. It costs the sacrifice of his son. Bible says, for we have all sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. That means we don't meet the standard no matter whether you are a professional sinner like me, whether you are a private one like my sister. (laughs) It means that we've all fallen short. So what Jesus isn't saying is, hey, this one costs me more than this one. What he is saying is she recognizes that she's been forgiven. You, Simon, you don't think you need my forgiveness as much. A grateful heart kills an entitled spirit. One of the things that we wrestle with when we get to the joy of the Lord is that the joy of the Lord doesn't flow from things. The joy of the Lord doesn't just flow from his blessing. Because if I get to that point where that's the only source of it, then guess what? If, if, if he 
stops blessing me for a season or changes the way he's blessing me, then now the joy stops in my life. Joy is not from that. Joy is from the seat of realizing what I've been forgiven of. Realizing that he is my inheritance, that he is my God, that he is with me and that he is present even in my pain. The joy of the Lord is my strength, not the joy of this life. And here, Jesus is reminding Simon, listen, Simon, he who has been forgiven of much, who views and understands what their sin is, loves much. But he who has a small picture of what they've been forgiven of, loves little. Joy starts when we begin to realize that I can have joy today because I'm forgiven. That's a powerful thing. And it goes a long way in killing an entitled spirit. And one of the things that I'm concerned of today in our churches is that we're full of people that have been taught that, man, if I do everything right, then I'll be blessed. Everything will go well. And 2020 has reminded us that one thing that we are promised in Scripture is that trials and tribulations will come. But Jesus said, take heart, for I've overcome the world. I want you to hear me today. Our joy rests not in the circumstances around us, but in the Spirit of God that lives in us. And we know today that we will survive, that we will thrive, and that we will make it through. Not because of my works, not because of how good I am, but because of his finished work at Calvary and that he lives on the inside of me. So I can take heart, I can celebrate, I can sing, I can worship, I can praise God, I can walk around with an actual smile on my face, facing all the trials of life because I know my end is not in this world. My end is just beginning when I step foot in eternity with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Joy is mine today, not because of circumstances, but because of God Almighty that lives in me. Come on, somebody. Amen. Getting to that place that we recognize that joy kills an entitled spirit. And number three, joy or a grateful heart gives birth to unashamed worship. A grateful heart gives birth to unashamed worship. Colossians 3, 15 through 17 says, and always be thankful. Let the message about Christ and all its riches fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to the Lord, to God with grateful hearts. And whatever you do and say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. I was in my uh, quiet time a few months ago, and it was just, an, it, I was, I was struggle busting. I was wrestling with the, uh, the loss of my dad, and I was just sad. And one of the things that I've learned about myself in this process of studying the scriptures, some things that some great counselors have taught me, is that feelings are not something that you actually ignore actually something you lean into. So one of the things that I just want you to know as your pastor is that I'm not saying go get a joy sign and plant it in your front yard because that doesn't mean anything. What I am saying is that it's absolutely okay that if you're feeling sad to face the sadness. And one of the ways in which I do that is I journal. It's not something I've always been good at, but I basically write my prayer, write what's going on. It's basically what I read to you in the scripture. I write what's really happening in me. I get it out on paper. And then I begin to write the thoughts of God. I basically begin to say, all right, God, I've gotten out of me what's in me. And now what are you saying to me? And one of the things that he said to me in a very hard moment. And I want you to hear me, man, as, as your pastor. I never want to misrepresent the tone of God. So this was a moment that I was, I was broken. I was sad. I was crying. I was upset. 
And the Holy Spirit spoke so deeply to my heart. And it was so sweet and it was so corrective. But he said to me, Aaron, the reason why you're missing your daddy so much is because I gave you a good one. And it wasn't like, oh, it wasn't, um, what he said next, again, I want to represent his tone. He said, son, would you have preferred that I'd have given you a bad one? So in that moment, in the tears and in the pain, joy was actually in my heart. Because now something began to flow out of me that was gratitude not resentment. What I'm saying to you as your pastor is that some seasons are harder than others. But you can find joy in any season if you'll stop running from the feelings and turn and face them. Some of you today are dealing with the loss of a loved one in this season. Some of you are dealing with 2020 that has not gone according to plan. Some of you are dealing with fear today that has literally gripped your life and basically you can't sleep through the night because of the fear that's trying to grip you. Some of you are just mad, just mad. The Grinch stole Christmas and you have absolutely received him into your loving arms. Listen, I get it. And can I tell you that God gets it too? But stop trying to change the way you feel and start facing the way you feel. Because let me assure you of something, my friends. God gave you your feelings to alert you when something's wrong. And this is that season, and I'm so grateful for it, that we don't drive around and we just magically find joy. But the people of God have to dig to find it. We have to stop running from some things and start facing some things. One of the things that I love about the scriptures, and do you know that most of this book was written while men and women were in captivity? That most of it was written when it felt like a spiritual midnight. That the Psalms over and over and over again were not just them in great times, it was actually them in sadness. That they were writing about what they believed would happen in the future. They were living at midnight, writing about the soon coming morning. I want you to hear me today. There is hope in Jesus. There is joy in Jesus. There is peace in Jesus and there is love in Jesus. And as we journey through this, this isn't us planting a fake sign in the yard. This is us discovering in this season that no matter what the circumstances are around me. Joy can be in my heart. There might be tears. There might be trouble. There might be sadness. There might be things that I have to lean into that are uncomfortable for me. But I can be rest assured that God is with me and He will help me navigate those places in my life that I might come to know how good He is. The joy of the Lord is not a theory. It has been proven. And we can find it. We can dig for it. Psalms 23, 6 has been especially meaningful to me in this season. It's after the most famous psalm in Scripture. And David says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. If you look at David's life, I wouldn't say that everything that he experienced was fun. Maybe you have more of a remembrance of all the high times in David's life, but David had a lot of low times. But here David talks about surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Some of y'all will will remember this reference because you grew up in church. But one of the descriptions of like, God has always been the hound of heaven. And that is literally when you look at the Hebrew, what David is speaking to. He's not saying that goodness and mercy casually follow me around. What he is saying is goodness and mercy are chasing me down. 
goodness and mercy are chasing me down. What it means is that when I'm walking fast, goodness and mercy is running after me. It means that when I'm going through a tough season, goodness and mercy are running after me. It means that when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, which is in Psalms 23, surely goodness and mercy are chasing me. I want you to hear me. God isn't far behind. His goodness and His mercy isn't way behind. His goodness and His mercy are chasing you down. And when we come to the place that every once in a while, we'll stop. We'll look behind us and we'll let God open our eyes. We will see that goodness and mercy have been following me all along. That is how good our God is. It doesn't mean that every situation is fun. But it means that if you live life long enough, you too can testify that even in the hard places, God was doing something awesome. Even in the hard moments. God was building something amazing. Goodness and mercy, they're not walking after you. They're chasing you down. That's how good God is. Can I get a good amen in this house? Why don't you take your communion cup today? Rachel, can you give me another communion cup? Mine didn't have the bread in it. I just, I can't, I can't fake that I have bread when I just talked about you not faking it till you make it. <laughs> that would have been funny. Oh, man. Thank you, Jesus. Can we just pray? Why don't you bow your head and close your eyes? Father, you gave this holy moment to your bride, the church. Father, we would do it regularly, that we'd do it consistently. Because every single time that we do it, we're reminded of your grace, of your mercy. Father, I just pray for all my brothers and sisters today that as we take communion today, that we be reminded that you broke the bread and that you gave thanks and you reminded your disciples that this is your body. Father, we are sustained by you. Father, everything that you are, we are because your spirit lives on the inside of us. And Father, you desire to make us whole. So Father, as we come to you today in this house, in houses all over this community and all throughout the United States and even world, Father, we remember that Father, you are the one who nurtures us, sustains us, provides for us. And we give you glory and we give you praise. Take and eat. And Father, it is your, it is your blood that provided forgiveness of sins. Your blood that cleansed us. Your word says as far as the east is from the west, you've removed our sins, taken our sins from us. God, I just pray that, Father, you would open our spiritual eyes so that we would see joy in this season. Father, that as we wake up, gratitude would be in our hearts. As we lay down, that gratitude would be in our hearts. That, Father, this is that season that we search to find it. Father, the greatest worship throughout Scripture wasn't done when everything was great. It was the sacrifice of worship that, Father, pleased you. Lord, in this moment and in this day, we want to offer that sacrifice. That God, we will sing your praise. We will sing your glory. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your forgiveness. We give you glory. We give you praise. Take and drink. Lord, I just pray for all of them today. That Lord, you would bless them. That you would keep them. Gosh, that you would cause your face to shine upon them. That Lord, you would be gracious to them. And you would fill them with your peace.